This conference will now be recorded. I appreciate everybody joining the call today. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you and your loved ones. Hope you guys get lots of chocolate because I love chocolate and it's a good thing. Uh, anyway, I thank you, Norval, for that, that wonderful introduction. And I'm a huge ASQ player and proponent. And I think that as a, as a member society, as a member-led society, we have a lot to offer the world. Uh, so this is just one way of giving back. Uh, today we're going to talk about using DMAIC to find, measure, analyze, improve, control, and, and how we use these things with, with my kid, Adam. Uh, and he is a, he's a child who is uh, autistic, uh, and he's been autistic, and he's still autistic. But uh, what we've done to use these tools to help him uh, be less symptomatic in our world. Uh, so what we're going to use is we're going to learn how DMAIC, Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, Control, can be applied in your own home environment uh, to improve the quality of life for a person and, and how they can have control over their own quality of life as well. We used a lot of different tools uh, across Adam's timing. He is, uh, today, he just turned 19 a, a week or two ago. And uh, we continue to use basic quality tools to, to help him on his journey. Uh, we've used designs of experiments, pew diagrams, all kinds of things. So we know that DMAIC from a Lean Six Sigma perspective or from a quality problem solving perspective is, you know, define the issue, measure it, analyze it, improve it, control it. You know, going through that recipe of taking those steps uh, so that we can make an impact and, and help Adam uh, with his uh, situation. So we had to work across our medical system, first of all, to figure out what was going on. Uh, and then what kind of measurements are out there that we can see and get a handle on so that we can make them better uh, so that Adam could be less sy sy symptomatic. And from there, as you saw what the measurements were, analyze what could be done with the various doctors and techniques that were out there. And, and there were quite a few techniques. But keep in mind, Adam is 19 today. and this was, we were starting this when he was two years old. So 17 years ago, a lot of this stuff wasn't out there that we have today at our fingertips. Uh, so, so some of our techniques and strategies were a little bit different than what you'd see today. Uh, and then as we found out what those gaps were, what, what things could we do to improve and make them better so we could get better results? And then how could we sustain those gains and control what we had and then continue to build on those things? So starting out with define, why doesn't the boy babble? Uh, by the age of two, Adam was not responding to us when we were talking to him. And, and you would think he was kind of deaf, but we knew he wasn't deaf. Uh, we took him to three sets of hearing tests uh, you know, by the age of two. And the pediatrician said, well, it's just a phase. And uh, they, they weren't very helpful. They, they knew he could hear, but he wasn't responding. Um, the child couldn't stand clothes or diapers. You know, it's really cute when you got naked little babies running around. But as they grow older, it's not so cute nor socially acceptable. And, uh, you know, Adam was always ripping off his clothes. He, he couldn't stand to have clothes on his body. It was, it was, it was a terrible thing. Uh, the child stayed indoors a lot. The doctor said, well, he's sensitive. Uh, and, and his body was covered in eczema and rashes on his face and in all the folding areas, like in, in your elbow and in the, in the crease where your leg joins your, your torso in the groin area. And um, it, he just had a really hard time. No wonder you don't want to wear clothes. Everything you wear just itches like crazy. Uh, and, and the doctor said, well, we need to use different soaps or bathe them differently. And, uh, you know, we, we tried all kinds of stuff. My husband and I were both engineers. And, and we were just trying all kinds of things to help this little guy get better. Uh, the pediatrician, uh, they just weren't very helpful then. Uh, but throughout that, he didn't cry. He didn't fuss. I mean, there was not a lot of outward verbalness going on. Uh, he was just a great, great little kid that didn't like to wear clothes. So after just trying all kinds of ways, we, we knew we weren't going to get anywhere with the doctor. Uh, so we had to go through other methods. And by the age of two, we had no language. And keep, when Adam was younger yet, you know, 12 months, 14 months, 16 months, we did have language. But that language all went away uh, right around the 17, 18-month time frame. 
Um, everything he had went lights out silent. He was still covered in rashes, very hard to get clothes on the kid. We went through a lot of duct tape keeping clothes on him. Uh, food passed right through him. He ate voraciously. You would have thought he was a starving child. He could consume an entire box of cereal. And uh, he was gaining height. He was getting taller and longer, but he was not getting good weight. He, he looked very, very starved. Uh, so then we went to a neurologist at a person's suggestion. And, and at two years old, he could do jigsaw puzzles for five-year-olds uh, upside down, which was really cool. Uh, he liked lining up toys, especially Thomas to train. That was a real big fun thing. And the doc said, well, his issues are physical, not neurological. Let's try some drugs. And my, my husband and I kind of looked at each other and said, well, we don't know what's wrong with him. What, what, are, what are the drugs going to do? And um, the guy said, well, it might, might change his behaviors. I said, well, it's not necessarily a behavioral issue when he's covered in rashes, and we just don't know. So we weren't, we weren't going to use drugs to treat something that we didn't know what it was. Uh, so he was out. So now we're kind of stuck. And we're just talking to all of our family and friends and relatives and say, anybody who will listen, we're kind of attacking people saying, has anybody seen anything like this? What's going on? So our sister-in-law lives in, in uh, Chicago and she was a Golden Apple Award winning teacher. And she says, you know, we've had some kids coming through with autism and you know, so some of the things that Adam's got going on is maybe it's autism. So, you know, we know how to study and research and deep dive, we went down the autism trail. And uh, as we started researching this, uh, it's got four fundamental areas, you know, sensory processing. Well, you know, Adam didn't like those clothes and, you know, he wasn't responding verbally. Uh, so that, that's a lot of sensory things right there. The speech and language delays, we were getting no social interaction. Child, you know, self-esteem issues, well, the child's too. We don't know if he has self-esteem or not. So we figured three checks out of four was a pretty strong uh, potential here. And then, it often is associated with other medical issues, such as gastrointestinal issues, heavy yeast, um, ADHD, you know, the, the, the deficiencies and hyperactivity activity, things going on. And we're just checking all these boxes saying, wow, that's what it is. So there's a lot of famous people that you just don't know that have autism out there. Albert Einstein didn't talk till the age of nine, and he was considered autistic. Diane Fossey with Gorillas in the Mist, uh, Benjamin Banneker, uh, you know, Isaac Newton, Lewis Carroll, a, a lot of people, uh, the book uh, Different Like Me uh, is really, really helpful for people on the spectrum to see that just because you have autism doesn't mean that it has to control you. Um, if, if there are ways to get in front of those symptoms, you can control it. And that's what we were trying to figure out to do. Today, autism affects one in every 59 children. And that comes out of the CDC, the Center for D Disease Control. And Adam is clearly one of those kids. So, you know, as we're doing define, measure, analyze, improve, control, we're in the define phase and we're trying to figure out, okay, what, what's causing his symptoms? Why does he have autism? And, you know, we got one kid and we call that a sample size of one. And, you know, was it, was it the shots? We don't know. Did it correspond with the shots, the timing of everything? It sure did. But were they the causal? Well, there was no evidence of that. Um, was it the environmental conditions going on? You know, I, we've got more pollution. Uh, you know, was it in the genes? You know, was it from his dad or from me passed on through? Um, was it just the measurement process? Was it something in the environment? I mean, maybe the carpets are outgassing. Uh, so we have no proof today, or back then either, of, of what the real causals were. So without that, we didn't know specifically what to fix, but we knew we had a lot of symptoms. And I'm willing to bet, there's quite a few of you on the phone call now, more than 100 or so, and um, have you ever taken cough medicine? So you know, you, you suck down some Robitussin, Robitussin or NyQuil, and it makes your cough symptoms go away. Now people don't know you have a cough and you're still contaminating all of them. Thank you very much. But the point is, is you are now asymptomatic. You're not coughing and gacking. You can breathe, but you're still medically controlling yourself. And we, we found a specialist who said, okay, well, let's see what we can do to deal with the symptoms. 
Because if you don't have the symptoms, people treat you more normally, which is what we needed to have with Adam as well. Um, I love this quote from, from Dr. Harrington. You know, the measurement is the first step. So it, if we know that Adam's autistic, what are the things that we can measure uh, so that we can understand it? And then if we can move the needle on some of those things, you know, can we control it and or improve it for him? So we, we found an autism specialist back then. And again, this wasn't a, a prevalent science 17 years ago. Uh, but this guy was phenomenal. Uh, he was uh, three states away from us, so we got ourselves on a plane and off we went. And this guy took, you know, hair cuttings and lots of poop and lots of blood and did cognitive tests. Uh, but he absolutely, totally knew what he was looking for. And he was one of the, the United States leading uh, specialists in autism. His name was Dr. Hicks. And the best thing that I loved about Dr. Hicks is he and I, we spoke the same language of stats. Hicks was phenomenal. We had normal distributions everywhere. And Adam wasn't on any of them. He was all the way to the left or all the way to the right, but never in the green. Uh, and in, in all of these results that uh, the doc was taking, uh, you could see, you know, these are just, uh, this is just one page. I think we got, like 150 to 200 pages of blood results, all of them showing exactly where he was at with regards to normal people. So from a measurement aspect, we could see where he was and where he wasn't. Uh, now, many of us take vitamins. A lot of y'all drink coffee, you know, and you, coffee gives you that perk up. Um, if you're tired and uh, you're not full of energy, you can take an iron pill. Uh, and, and those things are not prescribed, they're over the counter, and they help you be asymptomatic. So just like some of these things, there are many over the counter things that you can take to help get yourself to the center, to help you get normalized so that you're physiologically better in your body. And uh, that's what we started to look at here. Uh, we also noticed a real big thing with Adam, his yeast was literally almost off the map. He had three times the yeast of a normal adult. And in his gut, he had no presence of the good bacteria. So what happens is when you don't have that good bacteria in your gut and you're eating, a couple of different things go on. Your, the food doesn't stay long enough to impart the nutrients that you need, and it just shoots on straight through you. Uh, so no wonder why he was always feeling hungry. Uh, the yeast, uh, was causing yeast causes eczema and rashes. Go figure that one out. And the and the biggest thing is yeast loves carbohydrates. So this kid's pounding down a box of Captain Crunch cereal, or you know trying to eat a huge pizza or bread, all these high carb foods, and he's just pounding them down. So it was a it was a vicious cycle that was going on, um, causing his yeast to continue to grow and flourish. Uh, and then not having the necessary stuff in his gut. So these things are manageable in a non-chemical way. You know, I think you guys all remember Jamie Curtis, uh, Activia, uh, to help your gut. Uh, it, it's that kind of concept. So then uh, this kid's two and a half by now. And how do you get these things managed? Uh, the other thing he did is in his hair samples, uh, cutting the hair. We have, uh, we have in our bodies a, a chemical called glutathione. And what it does is if, if, if some of you men folk have ever been into a bar and you got a bouncer in there and he takes care of the bad guys and he takes them out of the bar, that's what glutathione does. It takes the metals out of your body. And your, your metals come out, they grow out through your hair or through your fingernails. And the glutathione grabs a little random metal molecule or atom, whichever it is, and it escorts it up to your head or it escorts it out your fingernails. And um, when we did Adam's hair cuttings, he had zero traces of metal in his hair or fingernails. That means that the glutathione wasn't doing its job. It wasn't able to attack, you know, to grab onto these guys and escort them out. I'm not talking a lot of metal. I mean, you're not talking like you're going to be a magnetic kid or anything like that. It's just trace amounts. So 
But what happens is when this gluteothione doesn't come out of your body, when it's not growing out your hair or through your fingernails, it sticks up in your brain. And that interferes with your ability to process language. No wonder the kid couldn't talk. He's got all this metal in his head. Uh, so uh, again, not a lot, just a little bit here and a little bit there. So, so how do you deal with that? Uh, so he had little to no traces in his results. And again, these things are manageable. Uh, then we, later on, we took him to, to get some brain waves done. Uh, the, your, your brain has five sections in it. And each of those sections has different wavelengths that are associated with it. And the red is hyper or over-functioning, and, and Adam was a, a very fun and wild child. Uh, but the, too much red can exhibit high frustration. Of course, keep in mind, he's got all that the yeast running around in him, and he's itchy as all get out. So he's got a lot of things going on with his body that needs to be managed. And, and, and to this day, we still struggle how the pediatricians could never figure that out. I think today they can. But back then, they, they just they didn't have that toolkit. Uh, so that's so, so as a baseline, we saw on the brave on the brain waves in the various functional areas, he wasn't there either. So we, we did all those measurements. We had we had so much measurement going on. So now what do we do with what we know? How do we analyze this stuff? Now, Kirkman is a medical company, and I'm not advocating Kirkman products per se. But Kirkman put out this roadmap for people on the spectrum. And this was probably one of the most valuable value streams we saw in our, in our approach to trying it. And Kirkman has given us permission to share this roadmap, so we're, we're allowed to share this. But what they did was, was really cool. In the middle, you see the, the, red, the red zones, what the various disorders are or the symptoms that you see. <clears throat> Excuse me. You see gastrointestinal issues. You see digestive function issues. Uh, a lot of people on the spectrum have sleep issues. You know, Adam wasn't one of them. So these are just some common things: immune deficiencies, uh, heavy metals. Uh, so these were just some things that were common for people on the spectrum. Okay. So those are the symptoms. Well, and what do you do about it? Uh, so then, in the yellow, uh, th those are the causes. This is why you're seeing those symptoms, that's the cause of it. And then in the green boxes, those were some of the natural countermeasures that you could take to offset those symptoms. Again, back to that iron pill. I'm tired, I'm fatigued, I take an iron pill and bam, I'm super, I'm, I'm okay again. So with that kind of concept in mind, as parents we thought, well these aren't chemicals, this isn't Haldol or Ritalin or or trying to, con, you know, trying to chemically uh, change behavior, we were trying to affect the physiological things that were going on in a, in a structured way so that he could be asymptomatic. There is no cure for autism. Autism is not going to go away anytime soon, I don't think. But the point is, is that we could make him asymptomatic so that he could have more control over his body and and how he was acting and interacting with the world. And, and we just got so much, uh, so much value out of this picture that uh, it, it's something that we share with everybody that'll, that we can sit on and make them listen. So, so Adam had a lot of things going on simultaneously. And uh, we couldn't address all the different things at once. And, and there were so many parallel issues. Uh, and the, the doctors like to turn on and turn off different things uh, to see if they're going to work. And, and that's a general medical approach. Try this medicine for two weeks, monitor everything, see if it works, and then turn it off to see if the effect happens or not. Very, very strong and logical approach. Uh, but we weren't very patient with that. We started a Pew decision matrix uh, to help us figure out where to shoot first. So, um, you know, we were looking for the various, did we address the rashes? Uh, so that we could, we could manage his body and keep clothes on the kid? Uh, did we aid in digestion so that he could start to gain weight? Um, how about processing language and enabling speech? So, so we did a pew diagram on him, and uh, you know, putting the weights on everything, we came up with, well, let's see what we can do to address the rashes first. 
and there's a, a met, an over-the-counter medicine called Candex. <clears throat> it is a yeast killer. Uh, Adam uh, takes lots of Candex to kill his yeast. Uh, he also now does not eat as many carbohydrates. So when you have less yeast in your body, you crave the carbs less. Uh, but, but getting off that carb uh, dependency is, is a hard thing to do. Uh, so the first thing we tried to focus on was addressing his, his rashes so for his body so that he could feel better. You don't want to talk. You don't want to communicate. You don't want to do anything else if you're, if you're constantly trying to rip your clothes off and you're scratching everything. So, so getting him to feel better first was our first order of priority. Um, later on, uh, as more doctors became available, uh, and, and we moved all, all over the country uh, in our in our careers. So we decided, you know, we were looking at different specialists, and Adam was a part of this uh, decision. You know, three doctors, Dr. A, Dr. B, and Dr. C, they all happened to be men. But these were the, the criteria that we were looking for, and then we used the Pew diagram for them to decide which doctor to go with later on. So we used the Pew diagram several times as a decision-making tool to help us be very objective and, and get the, the strongest uh, support that we wanted uh, for this activity. Uh, as we began to manage Adam's yeast, a doctor, uh, the doctor came up with uh, a lot of different recommendations, over 20 items uh, to manage his physiological symptoms. Something to manage the yeast, something to manage the metals something to manage the gut, you know, and, and there were 20 items, that's a lot of items. And they didn't want to do one at a time for two weeks, turn it on, turn it off. But I was trained in design of experiments and uh, I got one kit, a sample size of one, he, and we did one trial, one replication, <laughs> and it worked. Uh, we were able to shorten Adam's uh, treatment, experiment, uh, experimental treatment to about four to six months uh, to get him some very fast results than had we followed the, the tried and true cl clinician way. And I'm, I'm not saying don't abandon the clinician way. We felt we could do this because there would be no contraindicatory effects. We were not dealing with chemicals. We were dealing with natural over-the-counter products that, that were not considered dangerous in any way. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why we pulled this ahead like we did. So improve. If you know and you do not do, you do not know. This is one of my favorites. So as parents of a, of a kid on the spectrum, well, we didn't know anything. Uh, our doctors literally couldn't help us at first until, you know, a year later we found somebody who knew exactly what was going on. But if you, if you ignore it, then, you know, how do you help? And I, and I look at this in the work environment. You know, you, you walk by a machine and you, and you see a spill. If you know and you do not do, you don't fix anything about it, you're just as ignorant as you were before. So, so this applies every day in everything we do. So now we're seeing results. Look, Adam's got clothes on. He's playing with Thomas the Train. He plays independently on the computer, but he's not talking at the age of three. Look at that big old fashioned screen that's there. Um, but yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's got clothes on. This was amazing to us that we didn't have to duct tape him into his clothes. Um, the, the biggest trick we learned is those, those onesies with the footies on and they zip up the front. What you do is you cut off the feet, you flip it around and you zip it up the back and you, you put a strip of date, uh, duct tape across that back and he can't get out of that sucker. That was a very effective learning lesson for us. Fortunately, by the time he was three, we didn't have to do that anymore. Now look at his blood. You can see the before where he was at, and now you can see that he is uh, entering into symptomatically normal ranges on these key areas. And uh, we were doing bloods twice a year at this time uh, to see his physiological transformation. Now keep in mind, this did not cure his autism, but it did start making him much less symptomatic. Uh, we talked about him not being able to produce the good bacteria and the food shot through. So if you see an elephant, an elephant eats a prodigious amount of food, but they only, uh, they only met metabolize, I don't think I said that right, metabolize, there it is, about 10% of what they eat. 
So what comes out the other end is pretty much 90% of what went in. Uh, and it, that works for them. Uh, people are at a much higher metal, uh, metabolic rate. But uh, Adam was, was really poor on that. So he, his, his, he didn't impart the nutrients as he went through, and his stomach was hurt and upset. And he used to sleep vertically like this quite a bit. Um, once we got his gut managed with the digestion aids, there were three different, uh, you know, you guys have heard of Beano. You know, that helps you with, your, with, with, with one set of foods. So there was something to help with the carbohydrates, something to help with the plant and vegetable matter, and something to help with protein. But by doing those three things, um, plus he had probiotics on top of that, by getting that, that right set of, of cocktails going in, uh, we were able to get his gut straightened out in short order. Uh, and then he was able to finally start sleeping laying down. Uh, here he is at three and a half. Look at his face. There is no eczema on his face at all. He's got little chubby cheeks now. He doesn't look like a starved Ethiopian kid. Um, you know, he's got no eczema. He's wearing clothes. Bubbles are a big thing. That's his sister in the background. She was, she's still, she's a phenomenal kid. She's, she's always around with him. Um, at this time, we still only had about 20 words because we, you know, we were focusing first on the, on the eczema, then we were focusing on the digestion, and then we started going to the, to the brain side so that we could get, uh, get word and language processing. And now he's sleeping laying down. Uh, we talked about that metals management. We used almost everything OTC over the counter. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we used sign language with him. Uh, that helped a whole lot. A uh, sign language is much slower. Uh, you know, you have to think letter by letter. When we are talking, when we're conversing normally, we're going at a very rapid speed. But for a person on the spectrum, they can't process words that quickly, largely because of any metal accumulation that, that's kind of hooking the way through the brain. Um, and, and again, these are very, very trace amounts. These are just little, little tiny molecules hanging up in there. Uh, we do picture exchange of cards. Do you want a train? Give me a train. Um, then I'll give you your train. But this is how you enforced communication. If he wanted to, you held everything away from him, and then whatever he wanted, he had to come to you and ask for it, either sign language or through a picture, and then that forced that interaction to happen. Uh, we, uh, we were very blessed. We were lucky we were living in the uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan area at that time. And uh, a, a very uh, well-known uh, autism specialist, Dr. Solomon, uh, in, invented the process of play. Uh, that's uh, uh, learning, uh, play and learning with autistic youth. And uh, this is how you get kids on the spectrum to start to engage and interact. So this was one of Adam's favorite places. He could hide in there for days and he would make his little tents and his hidey holes and Alex was watching him in there. Well, the, the walls are bare. We're minimizing outward distractions. Uh, but we had a lot of fun with it, with these houses. We, and we, we did all kinds of things to really engage him in the play. Very, very powerful tool. Uh, we, we learned as we were getting language not to force Adam to look us in the eye. Uh, in our culture in the United States, it's, you know, if, if someone doesn't look you in the eye, it's considered dishonest. But in other cultures, you know, Asian cultures, it, it's, you're not supposed to look in the eye. That's rude. Uh, but for the United States, for an autistic person or a person on the spectrum, it's just too much information. They're, they're struggling uh, to compete with the visual and the verbal input to make sense of it so that they can process it and turn it back around. Um, I, have some, I have some very good friends who are deaf, and uh, we talk on the phone. Um, I'll, I'll say that with quotation marks. And I'll say something. The interpreter will then sign the language back to the to the people they'll sign back and then she'll speak it back to me so there's those, those steps in between to make that communication happen it's, it's not exactly the same way with a person on the spectrum but it's the same kind of concept they're not accepting and processing the language at the same rate that we're getting it so that patience is needed uh, we used to call ourselves twits two-word talkers um, we, we grew to three-word talkers 
uh, just so that we could say, give trade, eat table, uh, so that the, the words were simple enough, but the concept could be clearly understood and the language could be processed. And by building things up slowly that way, uh, a much larger repertoire was enabled. Uh, but by, uh, by honing in on, on managing Adam's diet, he, he, he doesn't drink milk at all. At all. Uh, the casein in milk and cheese are, are not good for him. He's not uh, allergic to them, but it's not helpful uh, to his diet and digestion. Um, by, by getting his diet managed, by getting the probiotics and the other things, he was finally able to get out of diapers. Um, people on the autism spectrum uh, typically have gut issues. Which, which really delays their ability to get toilet trained uh, because they just can't control their, their gut and things get very explosive. Um, so this was largely governed by Adam's GI issues and then we were able to get him out and that was just a huge, a huge opportunity for him. We talked about a little bit about glutathione and it's that tripeptide in our blood cells and I, I tell you, it's, that metal, it's, a, it's a bar bouncer. He escorts that metals out of the body. And one of the things that we learned in our research was that yeast eats glutathione. So you got, we called them the yeasty beasties. They're running around in Adam's body, because remember, he's got three times the amount of yeast of a normal adult. And they're just whacking all of his, yeast, all of his glutathione, so he's got no way to get the metals out of his head. And this is a problem. So um, people, people come in two kind of categories we, we've understood is that uh, Adam's glutathione, first of all, we had to get the yeast out so that it wasn't killing it all, but uh, we also then needed to, to get it kick-started again because his body wasn't producing glutathione on its own. And that's common for people on the spectrum, on the spectrum to not have a strong glutathione level. Adam didn't have any. Uh, so we were very fortunate. Uh, we were able to get the glutathione reintroduced into Adam's body and his body then started producing it on his own. Not everybody, it doesn't work for everybody that way. Some people on the spectrum are never able to produce their own glutathione, but there is a, there's an over-the-counter way to get glutathione into your body if you don't produce it. We were fortunate that, that Adam's body started kicking it off. Once we, once we got this part managed, we were getting full sentences. Adam was able to follow two to three step requests. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? We were getting uh, conversations for three to four terms where we, where we didn't have that at all. Uh, we did a, a brain uh, experiment with him. Uh, this was not painful, uh, not intrusive. It was really fun. He had a blast doing this. They, they do this uh, treatment with people with PTSD. You can see Adam's before wavelengths. And it's when you take your when you take your person to a gym and you go work out, you get muscles. And um, what this was was this was a brain gym. They put a little red cap on you with little electrodes, and you play a, you play a game with your brain. You watch the computer screen, and you're and you're playing a mental game. And by doing that, it builds your brain up. Uh, his, Adam was able to recover almost all of the wavelengths to the original level. The beautiful thing about this is once you get it built up, it does not decline. So, you know, once we stop going to the gym, we all turn into piles of fat again, but not with, not with the brain waves. Once you get them up there, they don't regress. So afterwards, we were able to see Adam uh, gain tremendously in the brain waves. Uh, he's not uh, physiologically normal in all respects, but he has taken it much more than it was. We got more than a year of social growth uh, within three months of doing this. And at the physical age of uh, 15, then Adam was start, able to start socially interact, interacting with his peers. It took that long before we were able to, to get him to even interact with people. Um, he could talk, he could answer anything you wanted, smart kid, uh, but to be able to say the hi, bye, please, thank yous, you know, excuse me, things like that, some of those things that we consider social you know, norms, he was now able to do regularly. So as we started getting uh, these things accomplished, how do we sustain those gains? How do we hold on to them so that they don't, uh, they don't regress? <clears throat> and how do we continue to build upon them? And, and Harry Kissinger was a, was a huge uh, uh, political 
a person in the United States, that each success buys an admission ticket to a more difficult problem. And I thought, boy, that's Adam, man. Every time he gets something conquered, here's the next thing. It's just non-ending. So, so you really need to get a, an attitude about yourself of what you're going to do next. And, and how are you going to, to get this thing to the next level? level. So, so with the foundations in place, uh, the, the medical insurance in the United States doesn't cover anything that's over the counter. And when we are buying, you know, 20, 30 protocols uh, every, you know, all the time to keep this kid asymptomatic. And of course, when you're two and a half years old, you're not swallowing pills. So we had to get these all in liquid formulas and put them in the bottles and bake them into foods. It was just crazy. And so we, we had a pill popping party when he was finally able to swallow pills. Um, today, he's on 25 supplements every day that helps him sustain his asymptomatic uh, activities. Uh, the data is reviewed annually. Uh, he graduated high school last year uh, with 31 credits and a scholarship. The kid is absolutely rocking it out. Uh, we're, we're so proud of him. Um, he still has no friends, uh, but uh, we believe he's going to be able to do great things. And, and, and even with a lot of these successes, he's still, he's asymptomatic in many areas, but he still doesn't socialize well. He doesn't have friends, and he's okay with that. Uh, his coordination's off. Uh, you know, he doesn't like, you know, he can't catch and kick very well. Um, and conversationally, he's done after just a couple of sentences. <laughs> he's not very situationally aware of what you're feeling. So if, you're, if you've got tears in your eyes or if you show an angry face, he's, he's probably not going to pick up on that right away. Um, he's a very concrete thinker. Um, I, I show this little bed picture because uh, when Adam was younger, we were in a park. And you know, we, we took the kids outside all the time. And this, this man was in the park with his young child. And, and the man was very angry. The child was screaming and having a tantrum. And the man was yanking the child through the park. Just, just a bad scene all around. And my husband you know, said to me, he says, boy, that guy got up on the wrong side of the bed. And, you know, we moved away from the area. And at the end of the day, it's nighttime. Adam's getting ready for bed. And he's sitting, he's standing in the middle of his room. And, you know, we said, what's wrong? And he's going, what side is the wrong side? And he's trying to figure, because he literally thought that there was a wrong side of the bed to get out of. Uh, so we had to explain that to him. There's, a, there's an amazing game uh, called the sodium, B-E-F-O-D-I-U-M, the sodium that was invented by a mom who had an autistic daughter. And it's a collection of 35,000 idioms and colloquialisms um, to, to explain these things. Cat got your tongue. Who let the cat out of the bag? Um, you know, all these things that we kind of take for granted uh, that, that we've learned once or twice. People on the spectrum have to really think about it and then remember what the meaning is. Um, and, and today, Adam drives literally. Uh, so he does drive. He's a, he's, a, he's a phenomenal driver, actually, which would drive you nuts. Um, 25 means 25, not 24 or 26. So if you're driving behind somebody somewhere in the world who's doing exactly the speed limit, please be patient. Probably a person on the spectrum. <laughs> um, or somebody who's a legal abiding citizen. Who knows? Uh, but... Um, it drives us nuts. It's like, okay, you know, he's, he's out there and, and we're just blessed. He's doing so well. So some cool things at 19. He's generally an all-A student. Uh, he's got a 4.0 in college right now. Math's his favorite subject. But, you know, he's not, uh, not like an Einstein on math, but, but he's, he's really good at it. He reads voraciously. and He can memorize an entire book or cartoon series. Um, he's fluent in Spanish. Uh, on a trip to France, he did a 3D puzzle so that he could memorize the metro system, which worked out quite well. We never got lost once. Um, and he draws his own cartoon. Uh, he's done several uh, cartoon books uh, that he keeps for himself. So how do we keep on building? I mean, we work, we work with his college today, but throughout his uh, elementary and high school years, these were the two strongest books we used. We partnered with the schools throughout uh, in the Ann Arbor area, we were within the Saline school system. I can't stress uh, how fortunate we were to be in that school system. They, they were phenomenal 
uh, with, uh, with kids that had uh, special needs. And um, that it, they truly were a partner in helping getting him to where he was at. The I need help with school is how to write a document called an IEP and how to advocate for yourself. And the hidden curriculum uh, is a training tool. It's a training system to help people on the spectrum decode the literalness into, into, into satire and, and all the different things. If you've seen Big Bang Theory and, and you see the sarcasm signs, that uh, they hold up for Sheldon and things like that. This is where they help really break down society's behaviors uh, for people on the spectrum. Uh, we help to write the IEPs, which are the individualized education plans uh, for the kids. Uh, these are, if, if you are in the automotive industry or military or aerospace, you know what a control plan is. Um, that's what these are. <laughs> it's just in the education system. Uh, we were, we, we took to that like water because we knew exactly what it was trying to do. And uh, we were able to partner with the school to get that going pretty well. Adam had what we call a daily social check sheet. So he could get A's in math and science and English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he couldn't talk to anybody. And, you know, he would just bump into you if you were in his way because he wasn't socially aware that you were standing right in front of him and you were in his way. Uh, so, you know, the, the social activities was, you know, did he participate in a class discussion? Did he answer questions? You know, <clears throat> and we did these, uh, the teachers did these check sheets with him every day. And he got points for these, and these points allowed him to have game time uh, on the weekends. Uh, so it was all for positive reinforcement. It was, it was, a, it was an excellent method. Uh, we got this out of the we got this out of the I need help with school book, a very very powerful tool that worked quite well. In the summertime, you you just, you just can't turn off learning for a person on the spectrum. So every summer, Adam, we did a refresh of the previous grade uh, for reinforcement and self esteem, and then we previewed the next coming grades and material. And by doing this, this gave him a head start on his peers. We knew what learning content he was going to go through, and it gave us an understanding if he was going to have any comprehension issues on, on certain things. Like story problems are pretty tough uh, because they're 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 not they're not concrete. You have to do some inferential thinking. So you know, learning tools and techniques for doing inferences uh, that was a that was a big challenge. Uh, but we once we knew what the problem was, we were able to block block and tackle and get it done with with the help of the teachers. Uh, so there's a there's a set of camps up there in uh, Canada called Camp Kodiak. There's more camps than this one. This is the one that that we found and identified. They specialize with kids on the spectrum. It's a real camp. They go and they're expected to make friends and, and you know you, you ride horses and you shoot arrows and you know, you jump in the lake and you climb trees. And, but they they specialize with kids on the spectrum. It was a phenomenal find for us. It worked quite well, and uh, he really found a niche there. Um, and they, they keep the kids anywhere from three to seven weeks, uh, and they, they really grow. You, when they come back, you see huge differences. So as we, as we worked through our life with Adam, you know, defining what in the medical system, what was, we knew he wasn't, something wasn't where we needed it to be for him. He was not a, uh, a typical child. Uh, so getting that defined took us a while. Finding all those various measurements that we could see, this is where he's at. And then, you know, analyze what can we do to close that gap to get him to be asymptomatic. Uh, so that we combined those metrics and the results and we created a plan of attack. And as those improvements happened, we continued to build on them. And then to control and sustain those gains. Uh, we, we worked with our teachers, our friends, and we used, to, we used con, uh, systems to grow those skills. This is one of our, our favorite uh, sayings that we have in the house. It's posted on our refrigerator. Ability is what you're capable of doing, and, and, and only you can determine what your ability is. Motivation determines what you do. So is this something that you really want? Attitude determines how well you do it. You can have a good attitude about it or a bad attitude about it. But perseverance determines whether or not you get it done. And, uh, you know, that, that really explains the cycles of Adam can do anything and he's very motivated in a positive way 
to, to make things better. And his attitude is so strong. He does not want to be defined by his autism. I wouldn't blame him. Who does? And, he and he's been able to persevere in everything. So as, as we look at him phasing through, as a, as a younger guy, you know, he's asocial. I got zero language, multiple GI and physiological issues. And autism clearly is controlling him. But by going through the demand, the defining, the measuring, the analyzing, improving, and controlling, we are now getting language. We've got GI and diet is managed. He's got, he's got school support going on all the way through. Today, he's a 19-year-old sophomore in college. Uh, he's, he's with his 31 credits and the classes he's been taking, he's now finishing his sophomore year. He's able to speak and interact. He's fluent in Spanish. He's physiologically asymptomatic. He has minor school support on, on just a few areas, and he manages his autism. I'd, I'd like to thank you all for your time today. Uh, there's, there's just a tremendous body of, of, of sources and ideas out there. Um, we did write a small book on him called uh, Sample Size of One. Um, we do offer it for free to people that have uh, kids on the spectrum. But uh, there's just a tremendous amount of resources out there for folks. I, I said, you know, I can't stress enough to, if that's what you have, but whether it's autism or something else, you can control what you do. You have the ability to, to define the issues, figure out what the measures are, and, and see what you possibly can make a difference on. Please feel free to, to contact me at jd.marhefko at frontier.com. If you have questions, if there's something I can do to help, and let me know. And I think that's the end of my slide deck. So I'm going to end the show uh, so that I can see the screen. And I'm going to give it back to normal. Thank you, JD. Uh, we do have about, uh, you know, about 10 minutes for questions. If folks do have questions, uh, feel free to type them into the chat box and we'll be happy to take those for you. Uh, uh, the name of the game is Bifodium, B-E-F-O-D-I-U-M. Okay. So as we're waiting for questions to come to the chat box, I'm going to remind everyone uh, that one week from today on the 21st, it will be our next webinar. It will be Understanding Customer Satisfaction with David Muncaster, uh, who's with Staples Business Advantage Canada. Uh, looks like, okay. So I see if other parents reached out. Uh, yeah, we, we, we talk to parents on a regular basis. Uh, we, we try to help anybody who's willing to listen. I mean, the biggest challenge is we've only, we've only done this with one kid. This is a sample size of one. And what's worked for Adam, you know, may or may not work for others. We have had very good feedback from, from parents who have tried some of the things that we've tried, where a lot of them have had similar results, but not fully. Because <coughs> their kids are different, their kids are wired different. But anything that can help the, the kids be less symptomatic is a help. Oh, it is? Okay, someone said that it's B-E-F-U-D. That's great. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, we have a question that came directly to me that nobody else is able to see. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and tell you what that is. Uh, well, first it's a comment and then a question. Uh, very warm-hearted and moving case study, uh, yet is the financial element critical for a demaic process? Uh, probably not. Uh, for us, it was a lesson learned because, I mean, in our first two years, we were spending 20 to 30 grand a year for the over-the-counter items. And uh, for other, not many parents have those kind of means. But uh, I, I see a, a question on here. If you know of any pediatrician run that, that runs that kind of, of blood work nowadays, uh, I do not. I, you can ask pediatricians if they do. Usually, you need to go to an autism specialist because they, they know what to look for. Um, and the, the pediatricians aren't always in line with the, with the autism specialists. Uh, anybody can get the book. It's uh, online, it's, an Am it's Amazon, it's self-published, and we kept it very low, it's $7.
Uh, we don't take any profit from the book. We, we donate all profits to Autism Speaks. Okay, looks like we've got several additional comments. Uh, we do have uh, about five minutes left for questions. If anybody does have a question, happy to take it. Uh, Stacy has a question for you, JD. Um, he goes to uh, the Wash. He goes to a local community college in the uh, Ann Arbor area, and um, he receives test support for a little bit of extra testing time. And then um, he he is required to self advocate. He has to let his teachers know that he might not hear their rapid speech as well as. So, you know, teachers on the on the board, on their dry erase board, you know, read chapters 10, do every other question, you know, then write me an essay at the end of the day. Uh, Adam's not going to be able to hear and process all of that. So he requires his teachers to write everything down that's not already on the syllabus. And the teachers, sometimes that's kind of a weird request. So he says, look, he says, I don't process language the same way as everybody else. I need this written down. If you have any questions, talk to my counselor you know, so on and so forth. But the, but the teachers have all been phenomenal. Everybody, every single teacher, professor has, has given him what he's needed to be successful. Uh, do, did you see Stacy's other comment? Yes. Thank you, OU is great, woohoo. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. We still have a couple minutes left. If anybody does have a, a question they want to uh, sneak in at the last minute here, uh, you know, certainly happy to take it. Well, we're lucky to have Adam. Somebody wrote, Adam is lucky to have such a supportive mother. And I, and I do think it's, his dad was a huge deal, too, because dad worked from home this whole time frame. Uh, he, he telecommuted uh, throughout. Adam's growing up while while I was traveling heavily, so uh, it's uh, it's been a it's been a team effort all the way through, and uh, you know Adam's been supportive as well. I mean we we just tried to keep everything as positive and 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 reinforcement as possible so that he could be successful because we we do expect the child to be independent living one day, and he owes us money, so he needs to get a job. Uh, an interesting question just came in from Leslie. I don't know if you see it or not. I do. Um, I would say absolutely. I, I think if you, the, the question is, is it possible to try this with someone who's 80 years old and has exhibited symptoms their whole life? And since, since much of what we have done with Adam is physiological, you know, if you take iron pills today, it's going to help you today. And if you're 70, if you take iron pills, it's going to help you when you're 70. I think the big thing is to identify where those physiological gaps are at uh, to, to get them to that specialist to, to help identify what those gaps are and then adjust accordingly. And, and that's where that uh, Kirkman roadmap comes into place because now I can pretty much look at that roadmap and, and figure out what we need to do without going to a doctor. But we've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, for the people that are living in Celine, uh, why don't you just go ahead and send me an email at home and perhaps we can help you with that offline. And that would be to your frontier.com email address, correct? That's correct. Okay. And we do have that up on the screen. Uh, Payush has a question too. Um, will this help all types of autism disorder? Um, I don't know. I would uh, think that it would be helpful in some regards for almost anybody on the spectrum. The, the biggest thing is getting the baselines figured out. Uh, the, the autism is on a scale of one to six. That's the Greenspan scale. Uh, one is completely canatonic. Six is your Asperger level. Uh, you can hardly tell. Um, you know, there's, there's just a few quirkiness things. Um, and then there's, there's things all the way across. 
but um, you know, Adam was in that two to three range as a as a young child, and today he's he's in that five range. You can tell he's autistic just after you know ten to fifteen minutes of talking to him. But nevertheless, he's he's found ways to proactively manage that. Uh, but I we we do only have the sample size of one. I I don't. I don't know for sure if it will help all types of autism disorders, but I, I can imagine that if they got their baselines figured out and figured where they were physiologically different from the norm and did some over-the-counter work to bring those back to, to center, that they might be less symptomatic in some of those areas. That would be my hope. Okay, we're right up against the top of the hour, so um, I think that's probably going to be about it for today. Um, of course, if you do uh, have any questions that you may think of later, um, JD, of course, has shared her email address. And you even have your cell phone up there, too. So that's, that's terrific. So um, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap it up for today. I'd uh, like to thank JD once again for presenting for us. My pleasure. And also uh, thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, we did, uh, we were able to record today, so uh, we will be posting uh, the recording to the section's YouTube channel uh, here hopefully later today. We will be following up with everybody who was online uh, to request your feedback as well. Uh, so be looking for something from me here uh, hopefully later today. Um, Look forward to seeing uh, some of you or may many of you next week uh, on the 21st. Uh, until then, uh, thanks for joining us and uh, hope everybody has a great rest of the day and happy Valentine's Day too. Uh, we'll see you soon. Bye now. Thank you. <laughs>